Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Montclair Literary Book Festival. I hope you've been enjoying today's programming. My name is Angela Abreu, commonly known as Angie, and I'm the founder of the Dominican Writers Association, a platform dedicated to highlighting the works of Dominican writers and providing them the tools and resources to become published authors. Though I do represent Dominican American literature, I am an avid reader and a fan of all the writers that we see here with me today all these wonderful debut authors. Um, ladies, thank you for joining me. I feel like I'm in family because Liz, I've known you for about seven years from running in poetry circles. You were at my, my book release. I was at your book release. Um, we're always, always supporting one another. Clavis, we met because you came to the Dominican Writers Conference and facilitated a workshop. So Risi and I are always in conversation. Um, and Rio, today is the first time that we meet you, but we could be cool, Rio. <laughs> we, I, got, I have room for everybody, okay? Okay. So ladies, let's get into it, okay? This panel is titled In Our Own Voice. You all have chosen to write from a place of identity and belonging to be vocal about who you are and unapologetic about it. Why was this an important factor for your first debut book? Anyone? <laughs> I'll start. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, oh, okay, it's done. Hi everybody, I'm Clavis. Um, what I would say is that um, I know that very often we think about the gap that exists in the American literary landscape and how for those of us who are Afro-Latinas or Latinas at all, many of us grew up with very limited stories that represented and reflected our lived experience. Um, there were books that we could read, but I think those narratives, at least from my perspective, tended to not always reflect what I thought was important. And so for me, in my book, Neruda on the Park, I really wanted to challenge some of the existing, what I consider to be existing narratives of what an immigrant community looks like, what immigrant women are like. And so especially both of my main characters, um, there's a mother and a daughter, and both my main characters are not women that are longing for home. The United States is home for them. And for me, that was also a very important aspect of, of my story, is that I think there are times where I think in this country the brutality that happens to immigrants is almost poised as happening because it's like we're temporary people. We come here, we earn some money, and we can't wait to go back home. And for me, I think it's very important that everyone just understand that the immigrant experience, these are people that belong here, this is our home, and so that's one of the reasons why it's important to me to focus on identity and, and belonging. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Está trabajando yo creo. That's okay, I'm Puerto Rican, we young, we young. <laughs> Um, I agree with all of those things, and I think for me, um, there's a, a poem in my book that talks about being Puerto Rican. Um, my family uh, is from Puerto Rico for many generations. I am first generation U.S. born. Um, and so my culture, there's a poem in my book that talks about being Puerto Rican and how my culture was all around me, but there was no Puerto Rican in our history books. And so it was like, well, where do I uh, come from? Where, what is uh, my identity? And I think that for a long time, I kind of linked being Puerto Rican to the identity of struggle because that's really what it was that I saw. It was like, well, if you're Puerto Rican, you know, you there's not gonna be opportunity for you to like get a good job or like there's not gonna be opportunity for you to like buy a house. That wasn't something that was necessarily for us. That was like a white people thing, right? Um, and so um, I think that for me, a lot of um, why I wanted to center my book around um, this uh, character who is Sarai, who's diasporican, was really like asking a lot of those questions because I didn't have any of the answers. Um, and so um, it was really important for me to speak to young people who are just existing um, and just living. Um, and I think that that's an important part of, of when we make it is centering on um, the importance of A, just being alive, right? 
but also B, not having any of the answers around questions of identity and how those questions are so important, even if you don't necessarily um, have a, um, you know, have, have the answers as, as to where that is. Um, and um, even as I was writing the book, there were things about my identity that I was like, oh my God, like, I didn't know, like, I didn't know this as I was doing my, my, um, his, my, you know, history and asking my mother questions. You know, I remember um, trying to write the childhood for Sarai and trying to write, like, that backstory. And I was like, whoa, I don't remember, like, my childhood history. Perate, let me, like, what's happening here? Because I don't, did I, where did I, am I, like, a clone? Because I don't have these memories, right? Um, and so, you know, I had to go back to my mom and be like, hey, why... You know, why don't I remember a childhood home? Why don't I remember you, like, cooking in the kitchen? Like, all of these things that people say that you're supposed to, like, remember or have. Um, and, um, you know, I learned a lot about my mom and the, and the traumas and the things that she carried because of stories that she wasn't allowed to tell, right? Or questions that she wasn't allowed to ask because there weren't spaces to ask those questions. They weren't spaces that were safe to ask those questions. And so you just kind of lived your life and you just, you know, you just hope that things will be better for your kids and that things will be better for their kids. Um, and I think that um, we do ourselves a disservice when we um, don't ask questions about where we're from. Um, and, I, and, and I also know how hard it is to do that, especially when you're focused on, um, on surviving. You know, and I think about my mother and I think about all of the things that we didn't talk about, right? And all of the reasons why we didn't talk about it. And a lot of that, was really just based on her just trying to survive and like trying to feed her kids. What do you want to know about Puerto Rican history? Like, ponte a fregal, you know? What do you want to know about your history for? Like, we got bills to pay, right? And so that's also very real. Um, so I, I wanted to write this book for a lot of reasons, but what, uh, you know, what you'll see throughout when we make it is just this theme of, of curiosity and this invitation for us to really like ask ourselves questions and, and kind of start there. Thank you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, you guys can hear me. Um, I, I'm glad that you went before I did because that was sort of the idea behind Wild Tongues Can't Be Tamed. It was, you know, when we talk about Latinidad, I never really see Hondurans in that conversation. I never see black, you know, Latinos in that conversation. And so that was one of the things that was super important for me was to invite contributors from the diaspora to start to, t to talk about their truths, to talk about what it was like when they were growing up. Because as a young person, I didn't find any real, you know, real stories. Fiction, sure, right? There, there's, there's a wonderful, um, canon of fiction stories that I identified with, not necessarily as a black Honduran, but just in general with a, a lot of the experiences that I was going through I was, as I was growing up as a teen. But there was nothing where I felt fully seen, like, okay, here's a black Honduran story, I'm a black Honduran, and this person is going through, you know, questioning their identity or not knowing where they fit in the world. And so that's, that's exactly my essay, sort of asking those same questions because society started to ask me, like, where are you from? You know, you, sure, you look black, but your hair is a certain texture or your skin looks a certain way when you're tan, so you have to be mixed with something. And I'm like, yeah, I'm mixed with black. Like, you know, so um, that was sort of my essay. But for the larger collection, I wanted all of these writers to come to the table to talk about a lot of things that we don't necessarily talk about in our community, which is religion, which is, you know, the LGBTQ plus IA community, uh, you know, mental health, uh, you know, family members that are in prison and what does that mean for, you know, peop the people in our family who love them and don't think they did anything wrong and maybe they didn't do anything wrong because, you know, they went to jail for fighting back against the government or et cetera, et cetera. So that was like Meg Medina's, you know, story growing up. She was really close with her uncle, but he was locked up when he was in Cuba and it was something that, no you know, the family members didn't talk about. It was like, he's a bad man because he was in jail and um, obviously life happens and so many people have these types of individuals in their lives and so it's important that we talk about it because in our community we don't necessarily talk enough about yeah. these types of topics um, for whatever reason you know like like Liz said 
we're just trying to survive. And so those deep thought out questions, you're like, man, I don't have time for this. Not because I don't have time and I don't want to spend it with you, but I really don't have time. Like I'm trying to make sure we have, you know, food on the table and et cetera, et cetera. I'm working three jobs. I don't have time to have this discussion with you. But then there are other people in the, in our communities, right? Our elders who are like, oh, we're not going to talk about that. And you especially cannot talk about it with anyone outside of your family. And so this collection, a lot of people ask me, like, why wasn't it fiction? Why didn't you focus on short stories? And I was like, because we have enough of those. Mm -hmm. You know, we have enough of those fiction stories that are, again, wonderful. I love all of the fiction. Give me more. But at the same time, as a young person, right, a lot of these people are reading these writers and they look up to them. Um, And particularly when it comes to uh, YA, it's also a fandom. It's not just a reading community, right? Like, it's it's sort of a fandom. And so people kind of tap in and and they uh, believe in their mind, like, you know, I'm going to put this writer on a pedestal because whatever they're writing about, maybe it really happened in their life, maybe it didn't, but I feel this connection to them. And so I said, what if all of those writers that have that connection with their readership they write about their life. And then those young people can see, I am going through this exact thing right now. You know, I, you know, and maybe don't want to be as religious as my family and I have thoughts about it, but I can't talk to anyone about it. But wow, my writer, you know, this writer who I admire went through that same thing and now they're, you know, an adult and navigating the world and they got through it somehow and they're okay. Oh, you know, that's, it's a conversation starter. It's inspirational. There are so many people who have read various essays in the collection, and they're just like, thank you, because I was able to pull out this section and, and talk with a friend or talk with a family member about the colorism within the Latin American community, about the anti-blackness that we suffered, or about, you know, coming out being trans or being queer or, you know, whatever it was, mental health, suicide ideation, alcoholism. And I'm like, wow, that's, you know, I'm happy that you're having these conversations. And I think um, that was sort of, intentional right and I'm so like I still can't believe I edited you know folks like Elizabeth Acevedo and Meg Medina and Lillian Rivera all of these wonderful writers who have gone through things in their life that you know maybe I didn't go through that exact thing but I have various family members various friends that have been there done that and I'm like wow look at what we all have in common in in some way and I think it's just so powerful for them to tell their truth to tell their stories and that's sort of the tagline for wild tongues can't be tamed it's like let your truth run wild mm. thank you Leo? oh these answers are all great <laughs> I actually I think I'm super grateful for this particular panel because I grew up I have a black American mother and a, a New Yorkian father and I grew up in Salt Lake so I felt totally divorced from both of those identities. And I th- identify as a black woman, and in my own family system, my dad's a black Puerto Rican, and I just felt, I just felt really isolated through colorism and through our, our part of the family. And so I think I, and because my mom's family is black American and one of the first families to pioneer this in the state of Utah, I felt really connected more to her history um, even though I think what's interesting, <laughs> I mean, we've lived in New York for 20 years, but, and I have this name, um, this Cortez, this name that I carry, that I'm constantly being perceived as Afro-Latina, and I am. And so I get to have those dialogues, but I've always felt, I, I've always felt sort of lonesome, like I just didn't have that community. And so the poetry collection that is coming out this year, I think, for me, was an opportunity to just say, like, that's a valid experience. That's a valid Boricua experience. That's a valid black experience to be able to come from a place where there aren't people who look like you and to define your own sort of space and sort of imagine yourself. I think um, that's kind of where I went in my poetry. And then writing the ABCs of black history, I think we're all talking about like these stories in our families that are quiet, but they're also not validated. Like Elizabeth said, like, You know, I worked at the Schomburg Center. He was a black Puerto Rican who didn't see those histories in the library system. So he collected our histories, not just as oral history, which is so important and is the nature of so many of our stories, how they're told and passed down in black and brown communities. But he said, no, we're going to put this on record. And so I think when I started working there, I was like, 
Man, there are so many folks that we hear about a lot in black history that are, are so valuable to hear about, like the story of Malcolm X and King, um, but there are so many community organizers. There are so many trans and LGBT folks that we're not hearing about. There are big conversations within the community and I got to be surrounded by that at the Schomburg Center and so I started to think like, what would my life have looked like as a young black child in a place like Utah where all I had of blackness were things that were projected to me, you know? Um, like I started writing poetry because I was watching Poetic Justice by John Singleton. Like those, there aren't po poets in my house, so I saw us, I had to see us on screen. And so I, th I think that's where that story came from is just wanting to put on record stories that I hadn't seen on record. Um, and I thought, mm. why not start writing toward my younger self? Mm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing, ladies. So as I learn of all these Latino writers that are being published and I have conversations with them, many of them complain about having their experiences questions, right? I remember when I was in college and my stories were always questioned by my professor, by my very Dominican nuances. Have you ladies experienced that in, while you're being published where you need to educate someone about your experiences so, so that, you know, you don't feel invalidated, right? Like, this is my life, this really occurred, and I don't need you to counter, you know, um, that experience, right? Um, how have you navigated that? I can go because um, Wild Tongues Can't Be Tame is a collection that includes various different people, and one essay in particular always gets brought up, and it's written by E.B. Zaboy. She's um, Haitian, and a lot of people ask me, why did you include a Haitian author in this Latinx, you know, collection? It's it's for it's for Latinos only, and I just laugh, and I'm like, well, if you read the collection, you know, E. B. Zaboy's essay is so phenomenal to me because it talks about these identifiers that we use in society to sort of, you know claim our existence in the world. And so in her essay in particular, she's like, well, when I was growing up in the 90s, the term was Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And so clearly, Haitians don't identify as Hispanic. And so she's like, I never fit in with that. But then, you know, um, it was Latina, Latino that came and, you know, I, I, I have feelings about that. But then this term Afro-Latina came about. And I remember having conversations with Ebi, which was sort of my inspiration for inviting her to be a part of the collection. She's like, yeah, I'm Haitian and, you know, D Dominican Republic is right there. And, and so I've never really considered that Haiti is technically a Latin American country. It's not just a Caribbean country. And I was like, exactly. And so for a very brief period of time, I like to tell people that Evie identified as an Afro-Latina and they're like, no, that, that's not true. And I'm like, ask her. For a really short period of time, that identifier felt comfortable for her to wear. And what I mean by that is these things are ever changing. It is okay for you to change how you want to identify in the world. And I had a similar experience where you know, my mom was like, oh, yeah, you, you don't tell people um, when she came here because she immigrated from Honduras. And so she's like, when they got here, you didn't tell people you were black because of the way they treat black people in America. And so you you told them, oh, I'm Hispanic. Mm -hmm. And then like they would still treat you not so great, but they would treat you slightly better than what they would treat a black person. And I'm still sitting with that, that like they were told when you come to this country, do not claim your blackness claim that you are Hispanic. And that has its own, <laughs> its own issues within the world of people of color. And, and you know that's sort of the title of my essay, Orbiting a World Full of People of Color, because you could feel comfortable in, in one group, but still feel that disconnect, right? And, and so that's sort of been my experience my entire life. And so there's that, and then other people are like, well, you know, this collection doesn't really encompass the entire <laughs> Latin American experience. And I'm like, of course it doesn't. And like, and I'm in no way saying that, but because it features more black people and more people who identify with the LGBTQ plus community and, you know, indigenous community, you feel your experience isn't reflected in this book. And so you don't think it's an accurate portrayal of what the Latinx diaspora represents. And so for me, it's been a lot of 
why don't you sit with that question that you're asking me? Why don't you sit with that criticism? Because these are real people's lives and their experiences. This isn't a fictional collection. And when they're reminded of that, they're like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> and I'm like, right. So, like, these are real people's lives, and these are this is their real history. So when you question that, when you critique that, make sure you remember that. Um, I, you know, I think that the question about how our work gets questioned and rejected is one that I've had to deal with um, in very painful ways. So, you know, I went to an MFA program, a very prestigious program, and I mean, I, when I studied in undergraduate school, I won the awards. I mean. Not to be stuck up, but I was set up to believe that I was going to be a star, <laughs> okay? And then I came out into the world, and, you know, I had an agent, right, before I graduated from my MFA program, and we're working on this other book, which is not Neruda on the Park. And, you know, um, my agent and I started working together, and we were working together changing the, the book, editing the book, which is what's supposed to happen, but my agent ended up leaving the profession. And so then I went into the market to try to find an agent. And again, it wasn't hard to find people interested in working with my book. But I found that a lot of people wanted to change what the book was doing because of the market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and at that point, you know, I was maybe 25 years old. And I was like, okay, let's, okay, let's change it. And so I ended up with an agent who, now, in hindsight, it's very painful because I think I compromised my artistic integrity because I was just kind of desperate to get my book out. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be in the writerly world. Um, we had an editor who I had met who had read the book and took it to, you know, when you were in the publishing complex, you have to get, um, you have to get um, consensus internally before you can offer to buy a book, and with, with that book, she could not get consensus. And so, you know, me and my agent went again through a, a round of, of edits where, I mean, I was just like, I'll do anything at that point. <laughs> I was like, what do you want me to do? You want me to change, you know? And it was like, they made, it was just very anti what the book was trying to do. And now in hindsight, because they still didn't buy the book, even after I compromised, and even after I changed my book in these unforgivable ways. <laughs> um, and then I was just like really heartbroken because of course I had to like fire my agent. Um, the editor and I ended up having a really good relationship so she was very sweet and she just encouraged me to work on another book which at that point I had already started working on another book which is Neruda on the Park. And that was 15 years ago, okay? So, I left the community. I left like the writerly community. I felt really wounded. I was like, I don't even know if it doesn't matter that you're talented and then the market will ask you to do something with your book and even if you do it, they don't buy it. Then like, what the hell am I doing here, you know? Um, so for me, it was, you know, in hindsight now, I feel really fortunate because, you know, about four years ago, I went through a really painful personal experience. Um, my child was going through a lot of medical issues, and I almost lost him. I almost lost Julian. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I told you that story. Um, and it was only at that point that I had been working on Aruda on the park. I worked a full-time corporate job. I met my husband, and we fell in love, and like we made babies. So it wasn't like I was sitting around being sad that I wasn't a writer. I had kind of been like, I'll just park this, and at another point in my life, and I kept, yeah, and I kept, you know, I kept working on my book. Like I would work on my book, you know, during my birthday, which is in June, and during New Year's resolutions, you know, I got writer's residencies, you know, during that period of time. But it really wasn't until four years ago when I almost lost my son that I was like, like I'm not aligned with my life's purpose, and I felt like I had let this bigger society harm me as an artist. Mm. And at that point, I decided to like come back into writing, but to do it my way, which was to not compromise my book. Mm. And I was like, you know what, it doesn't matter how long it takes me. I knew that the idea that I have of like portraying these two women and it's like the mother 
they're both under threat. Their identities are under threat. Gentrification arrives in their community. And what we see is the mother come up with this idea of like a crime spree. And she's like, we're going to make all these white people scared so they can't cut, you know, they're not gonna wanna move into our neighborhood. And she gets people within her own community to volunteer to do like the crimes and to be the victims. And meanwhile, her daughter who just can't, you know, she's a lawyer, she's got all this money, she's upperly mobile, she loses her job and she has to confront what it means now to be like a person who doesn't have work. And how does she get her life to be full of purpose? Um, so, you know, I just realized that the book wasn't working and when I came back four years ago, and I was like, okay, I'm ready to come back. So like, rolled out the red carpet. <laughs> and that's not really what happened either. Like, it wasn't, you know, I didn't get an agent when I first started shopping my, my manuscript around. And I was like, okay, so I'm gonna have to work. And that's what I did. I went back to school. Um, I did writers' conferences. I understood what I was trying to do was, because I had to show like the breakdown of a woman's um, like self. And everything that Eusebia, the mother, does comes from a place of love. Like, every, even though, like, the whole crime spree gets completely out of control, like, the whole time is coming from a place of love. And, you know, it took, like, two years of working on the book, and then I got an agent, and I worked with an agent for, like, six months. And when we were ready to go to market, the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. So now nobody was even reading uh, proposals or books. Um, so I'll just say this, that like, just because I know I'm talking a lot. Um, what I learned is that this whole idea of like writing our stories, like first of all, you have to make sure that you're writing a good story. You know what I mean? Like I think sometimes we all get really defensive yeah. about a market that's hostile to us, but if we're not writing a book that is strong, that is beautiful, that's compelling, you're not gonna sell it. You know, it doesn't matter how true to your own experience it is or to the world. And so for me, it was one lesson to learn. And then the second lesson was just, just about that artistic integrity that, I mean, I, when we took my book to market, it sold in two weeks. And on the other side of this now, like my book is a lead title for my publisher. There's like so much love and support internally for my book. And on the other side of it, it's like my friends that read the book love the book. And so for me, it's like what I found on the other side is so much love and support, but it was like a really painful process to get here. Um, and so, you know, this whole question about, it's, it's very nuanced and complicated for me because I feel like I had to like fall on my face and compromise things I shouldn't have. But I'm, I'm glad now that that book didn't sell. Because imagine if that book would have sold. That, that book wasn't authentic anymore. You had changed so much just for it to be what the market needed, yeah. right? It yeah, was, but it I was think no people longer do that, that masterpiece. Yeah, I, I could, think I could imagine do. that people do. But anyway, but it's a happy story. I'm yeah. here in front of you today. My book comes out in two weeks. Please buy it. <laughs> <laughs> how about you, Liz? Because your book is very, how do we call it? Very urban, very street, very in El Barrio, the language that you use, right? Um, which a lot of us experience because we grew up in these neighborhoods, right? But when you are selling this book to to white audiences and they're looking in and they're like, what, what the hell am I reading? You know, yeah. and, and how are your editors and your publishers receiving this when they first get it? You know, I know that you were approached through Instagram, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you used to, because you, you I, I tell people, you never know who's going to, who's reading your stuff. Just share, right? You never know. And, and Elizabeth was one of those people that constantly shares pieces of her work, which is, compelling, heartbreaking. She talks about her mom, about religion, about so many things. And then you had an agent approach you and ask you, you know, if you had a book and you were like, not yet, but we could work on it. I got a few pages. <laughs> we're going to figure it out. <laughs> um, I, yeah, this question, thank you for, for, for answering, um, y'all these questions, because I think what I'm hearing is really like this, um, this return to self, you know, because I think that we get these messages from everywhere um, of like what you supposed to do, yeah. right? And even me, like when I was first starting, I was just like, you know, attending writers conferences and like workshops and like just listening for like 
what the steps were. Um, and every time I thought I had the steps, somebody, like another author would say something, and I'm like, well, that's not what the last author said. Hold on, this doesn't make any sense, right? And it wasn't until, you know, uh, uh, when I started putting the book together, I was like, oh, wow, like, my journey is really my journey. Like, yeah. this is really, like, my step is going to be different from your steps, from your steps, from your steps. And that matters. Like, that really matters for you to, like, really uh, uh, take uh, importance of your personal journey to get here. So for me... Um, the the language in my book and 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 some of the ways that I that I use like colloquialisms and just a number one came very naturally for me, but b um, you know stemmed from from very personal like you were saying very like painful experiences because I so I dropped out of high school in the tenth grade. Um, I had a lot of traumatic experiences growing up, and you know after like research and like talking to doctors and stuff, they're like, listen, that really changes the way your brain works. You took and I'm like, oh wow. So a lot of like my language, like developmental skills, like I'm still working on them, okay. <laughs> um, but so you know, uh, there was you know when you're in tenth grade and you go to college, that's really when you start to develop like communication skills, how to communicate with other people, you know, how, learning language, expanding your vocabulary. That was all kind of stunted for me um, at the age of uh, 16 uh, when I gave birth to my daughter. So there was um, a lot of uh, things that I just didn't know about the world. Again, I was really focused on survival. Um, survival was my language. <laughs> like, you talk to me about how to survive. How, like, I'm a, you I know what I'm saying? You. I got you. <laughs> um, but so... I realized that uh, I was different in my um, in, in in the way that I spoke in my language. I mean, it wasn't different in my community, right? But when you go when you step outside of these places, and I got kind of like my first job. I remember because I was like, oh my god, I got a job in the office. This is like fly. Like I got a phone and everything, <laughs> right? And when I when that happened to me, um, I realized that um, I was being looked at in 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 a very particular way, right? Um, and that I had a lot to do with the way that I was communicating or not communicating in the ways that were acceptable for folks. Um, and I had a supervisor at the time who made it her business to other me, um, and made it her business to um, point out the ways in which, like, my communication was def deficient or, you know, different or, like, she would point out my accent or, like, point out. And so she would talk, she would say, like, really big words, like, intention, <laughs> I say big words because I was just, it's big words, right? Like, intentional, like, seven-syllable words. And I was just like, and she would say it very intentionally. And the reason why I know was because she would ask me, do you know what that means? And, you know, it wasn't, um, I didn't know the word condescending at the time, but when I learned it, I was like, oh, she was being mad condescending, <laughs> right? Um, but so what I did was I started to write down the words that she would say, um, and I had a notebook that was dedicated to every quote unquote big words because all of the words that we use are big. I don't give a fuck if they're the simplest word. Every single word that we use is big. As long as you are talking like talking your shit and saying your truth, you speaking big. You feel me? Entonces, I used to take a notebook and I used to write down all of the big words that she that she said and I made it my business to come back and at some point that week I will use that word in a sentence. <laughs> That's it. I was like, you're not gonna play me. Can you please write that as a not your next? I novel? have it. This is the first time that I've spoken about this. Please do. <laughs> but That's I why would. We need a part two of when we make right. it. <laughs> and so when I was writing when we make it, I wanted to make sure that I was very true to um, uh, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old Elizabeth, who was mass smart. Be, but because of the way that she presented or she spoke or whatever was not, um, uh, uh, was really underestimated, right? Um, and so uh, I was really, I was kind of triggered when I like put the book into my, <laughs> to my publishers and to my editors. I was like, don't say no shit to me because <laughs> it's going to be wow. Um, but, you know, I think this is why, number one, it's important that, you know who you're working with, yes. right? And, and I that think you know that, who you are. And then right? you know who you are. But number one, that you know who you are, right? And we're talking about compromise, right? So it was like, what am I willing to compromise? Right. And if that is something that's fine, then that's fine. And if it's nothing, that's great too, right? But you have to know yourself. And then you have to know who you're working with. Are you working with somebody who's going to 
make you compromise yourself for whatever reason, right? And is that gonna be okay with you? And so I felt really lucky that my editor was not about the shits. Like, she was just like, hey, I believe in this story. I believe in the way that you want to tell this story. I mean, she was like really my champion, and I say that forever. Pero what happened was, <laughs> when we get to the point of like, uh, what is it when they like really scrutinize the copy edits? The, the Okay, man, that was a different story. Because folks were coming back like, uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> what does piraguero mean? What is that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so there's, there's, I remember, I always say this because um, uh, it, I say for supermarket, I say supermercado. Yes. And I say it with an L. Yes. I just do. Other people <laughs> say it with an R, supermercado, well, which Puerto is Rican. fine. But we say it with an L. So <laughs> I spelled super, supel, right. S-U-P-E-L. Yeah. And it came back to me, and I was like, no! <laughs> um, because now I'm being triggered, like, oh, you know. <laughs> now I'm just like, all the trauma from, like, my first job, but right? Like, you're not speaking right. Was that a deal breaker, though? It, it, it <laughs> wasn't because I learned of Stet. I was okay. just about to say that. Okay. <laughs> I learned about Stet. I don't, it's, I don't know if Stet is an acronym for something. I never asked. But I know it means leave my shit alone. I was just about to like, keep it. <laughs> yeah. <I'll> touch it. <laughs> And so I learned that you don't, I didn't even have to explain anything. I was just like, stat. I, I plead the stat. I'm at. Actually, <laughs> stat. And, and it was fine. I didn't really get any pushback. But there were a few instances like that in regards to language, in regards to how I used it, um, in regards to spelling of certain words that were true to the character's experience and that really wouldn't have... Um, the book wouldn't have been uh, as authentic as, as folks have been saying had I been like, oh, okay, uh, we're going to change it to the quote-unquote proper or whatever. Um, so you have to know yourself. You have to know what you're willing to compromise. And um, be true to yourself. Be true to your story. Um, and uh, know who you're working with. And, and really make sure that you're working with somebody who's going to really believe in the work that you're doing wholeheartedly, not half-assedly, because that's going to make a big difference. Thank you, Liz. What about you, Rio? Uh, I, well, I, on the other side, on the publishing side, so a lot of my job now is to evaluate the sales potential for books that come in through acquisitions. Mm. And so I think my job in publishing, I've experienced a lot of that on behalf, it feels like, for a lot of other writers where I'm trying to justify in a practical way the worthiness of certain writers' work. And so mm -hmm. that, I think, has also been an evolution. I started in publishing in 2007, uh, before Penguin Random House was, pe was, just, was just Penguin. In the paperback sales division, there were no other black people. Um, crazy things were said to me, like lots of people <laughs> lost their job in a merger. It felt like I, I worked in Mad Men. So I came up in that place where it was just a pain in the ass to look like me at work. Like I was explaining a lot, I didn't need to, I, I was underpaid, I was sexually harassed, like all kinds of things. But as I came up in sales, things started to change, the industry changed, and Clave is like your story, even thinking about what it would have looked like 15 years ago to sell a book at an acquisition board is very different from what it looks like mm. today. Um, I still think there's, you could speak to this too, there's so much room for growth. There is unlimited room for potential, but I do feel like I'm sitting in the room now where you get to be, I see more black and brown writers doing exactly that, like choosing who they're working with, where at one point it felt like you were just the anointed one that you were gonna get published that season. You were the black writer on the list. You, your book was gonna come out January 20, 28th, and that was like your on sale date, or you were the, the Hispanic writer on the list. And now, I think what I've been able to see that's been really exciting is the empowerment of writers, where you get to say, you know what, I want a black editor. Like, I had a black editor for the ABCs of black history, and not just a, a brilliant black editor, Tracy Todd, who is a children's book writer herself, but she just knew, like, we didn't, we had a shorthand that I wouldn't have had with a different person who could just say like, oh, she knows about this conversation between Booker T. Washington you know, and the Tuskegee School. Like she knows about that off grip. Like we didn't have to, 
I didn't have to define things for her. Mm -hmm. um, and so or that, like a period of educating yeah, before you could. Yeah. I didn't have to do any of that and it made the process more smooth and I trusted that if there was a blind spot I had that she was my partner and would be able yes. to kind of see that for me. And I think that's something I've also witnessed more on the industry side is that decision to say like I have options like if I don't like the way you're asking me to compromise my work, I'll just go somewhere else. Like, there is a different place for me to go. And I, like I said, lots, lots of room for growth still, but I think um, it's felt really, I left publishing to go work at the Schomburg Center and have my child and never leave Harlem. And it was really beautiful five years. And now I'm back in this post-murder of George Floyd world, uh, which is just what I gotta call it. Like, it's not even anything else. Like this. That this man was murdered and lots of industries changed or felt like they needed to change, mm. including publishing. That's where my job came back. That's how I was re-recruited. And so being here on the other side of that murder uh, looks totally different than it looked even five years ago. And I think that's interesting. And now I feel like I'm just looking around and making sure that change is sustained. Like mm. my biggest fear is that some of these changes were made as just reactionary change mm -hmm. that isn't gonna last. And so I feel like I'm always just looking over my shoulder at work and finding ways like how can we plant this in the ground? How can we make sure mm. we can't we don't let it go? And so mm. that's kind of I think where Thank I'm you. from there. That, that was going to be one of my comments about how has diversity in publishing changed within the last, since George Floyd, right? Because I did feel that it, it was kind of performative and that if anything was changing, it was going to be just to shut everyone up, right? Um, but to see you in publishing, to see Cerisi in publishing and so many other Latino faces in publishing um, has really, you know, made me feel hopeful that now our Latino writers or writers of color are able to go into the publishing industry and feel mo a lot more confident. And the fact that, you know, like you said, now they have options. You can speak up and say, you know, can I have this, this editor or this book cover illustrator? For example, Angie Cruz makes sure that her illustrators are all Latina women. Um, Elizabeth, you, you requested a Latina um, an amazing Latina illustrator as well. I don't know who your illustrator was, but um, when we work in the industry, we bring our people through, right? Um, which I think is powerful and, and so amazing to have. Um, my Can I just add one thing too? Because yes. I think there's just like a broader ecosystem that I also think changes the dynamics for all of us. Like I think the fact that we have like black bookstagrammers that honestly are doing like yes. godly yes. work. Yes. Because it's like, and they're Latino, you know, like every, I mean, it's just like a very vibrant, rich yes. environment. And I think that because of that, there's, it's still a business. That's what I tell people. I tell mm -hmm. my students all the time. It's not just like having a good story or a beautiful book, it's having a book that people believe will sell. That's viable. And so, yeah. I think one of the biggest changes is it's, and it's alongside, I think it's, yes, post all this horror that we've lived through, but it's also, I think, within our own communities, I think we're just more connected. And because right. of that, I think right. we're able to, like, just yield power in a different way, mm -hmm. financial power, yeah. and like the power of word of mouth in ways that just weren't possible before Instagram or before some of those other things. Mm -hmm. I totally I was, agree. I was that. just gonna say that, that, um, really the digital community in general, um, which, you know, I've only worked in publishing for a decade, but even before that, when I was in school and researching it, you know, I remember eBooks and that was like a whole big thing that like exploded in, in the publishing industry and now audiobooks are exploding, right? And I just feel like this whole digital aspect is allowing people to feel more connected. We saw with bloggers in general, when I started, that was the big thing. We have to get these books out to the bloggers, right? It wasn't just media anymore, it was, it was bloggers, which is that, that community of, of word of mouth. And then it was Twitter, book Twitter, you have to be on book Twitter. And then it was Instagram and now it's book talk. And I think just just as these digital communities like you know keep growing and growing and growing it's helping to share knowledge to share experience I think about what happened in 2020 the industry just 
just sort of like blew, was, it was shattered and it's being rebuilt right now in my opinion. You know, it, I thank two black writers, um, L.L. McKinney and Tochi Onyabuchi for starting the hashtag Publishing Paid Me because I think that was a way for writers of color in particular to see what, what, what are we being paid? How much are we being paid? And like, what have the writers before me been paid? Even though black people, you know, black writers weren't supposed to participate, they were trying to see like in general, what are non-black writers paid? Whether you're a person of color or and a that white was writer. Eye-opening. It was very eye-opening. And so sharing that knowledge, a few writers like Nana Kwame was someone who renegotiated. They went back to the publisher yeah. and had the opportunity to renegotiate their contract unheard of, you know, unheard of. And so I think just, you know, what, what Rio was saying about the intentionality of how writers can now work and be thought partners. So now, now you don't necessarily have to take what, you know, your publisher is telling you, but at the same time, you know, you can find this middle ground of how can we be thought partners in, in publishing my work and not necessarily just sit and take everything that they're telling you to do. And on the, on the publishing side, you know, some people don't like that change, right? I'll just be realistic, but I'm happy it's happening because, you know, the way books are marketed from the copy that you see on the back of the book. Like for me, I am challenging publishers not to use, this is a Latinx book. I want to know, is this a Honduran writer? There were three Mm -hmm. Latin, you know, Latin American writers that I've seen have new book deals. I'm like, this is so great. And then I'm corresponding with them because I'm like, I just want to celebrate you. I want to, you know, order your book, but I want to get to know you too so I can mm -hmm. be in community. And I emailed them and three of them were like, oh yeah, I'm Honduran. And I was like, what? Like drop the mic because for me, I'm always on Twitter tweeting, where are all the Honduran writers? I have that same sentiment. <laughs> and so these three people, I said, you know, you don't have to do this, but like the copy on your book just says Afro Latina or, or Caribbean or Caribbean or, yeah. or, or, you know, and I said, maybe, maybe if there's a chance to revise the copy, you might want to throw, you know, that you're Honduran in there. And they were like, you know, I never thought about that. And I said, well, representation matters. When I was in right. my MFA programming, right. you know, researching writers, I wanted to study Honduran writers. There weren't any. And if they, if they are out there, I apologize. If you're, you know, if you did publish something, not out there, you it know. It happen. But I think that's slowly changing. It's slowly changing because writers are now more encouraged to say, like, hey, about that marketing copy, the way you're positioning my book is not working for me. I feel like you're missing the mark. And not every single publisher is going to digest that and take it in and, you know, advocate for you on the inside. But it's, like Rio said, it's moving in the right direction. There's room for growth there. But I think now is the time where writers of, you know, any background, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a writer of color or not, but I think you can feel empowered to sort of have these discussions with, with your publishing team, which is, again, was unheard of back in the day. It's going to take some time, but it's, it's slowly happening. So I think, Leslie, how much more time can I, do I have time for one more question? If we could, okay, got it. So I was recently in conversation with Camille Gomera, um, the author of High Spirits. And Camille has been very vocal about writing for the Dominican community. And she has said, this book is for my Dominican people. Those are the only reviews I care about. She has been vocal. And I was like, yes, yes. Because um, there's so many Latino um, stories that we write, and they're very specific to a community of folks, right? There, there's people that you want to touch with your story. Um, so who are your audiences? That's what I want to know. Who do you write this book for or compile this, this collection of stories for? <laughs> for Wild Tongues Can't Be Tame, I specifically was, you know, intentional about writing it to, um, first, all of the young people and readers of all ages who felt like, you know, it was taboo to talk about mental illness, taboo to talk about um, religious, you know, your religious connection and relationship within within your community, um, you know. But then deeper than that, I really wanted to bring black writers to the forefront, black writers of the diaspora to the forefront, um, and particularly, um, you know, to give these people an opportunity to talk about 
the representation that we see in our community and how sometimes, you know, even within our community, they're like, oh, we're in community with you. But then when we talk about the stuff that's no one likes to talk about, we're like, but I thought you were in community with me. I thought you wanted to have this conversation. So I'm specifically, you know, put the collection together for those people. But for the readers reading outside of the community, I want them to see that, like, we are so diverse and like there is no way that you should make up your in your mind what the one, you know, Latin American person looks like, what they should sound like, because we come in all shapes and sizes from various different backgrounds, you know, coils to straight hair to braids to weave, whatever. Like it you should not have in your mind what an, a Latinx person looks we like. We don't all look the same and we don't all speak the same. Exactly. Spanish is not universal. Exactly. Oh, speaking of copy <laughs> editors, that was so much fun. Going going through each each essay to have them say, well, this word, and I'm like, yeah, but in Haiti, like, this is what that means. In Panama, this is what it means. And they're like, this particular f fruit that was mentioned, and I'm like, I know, I know, yes. In, in Puerto Rico, it's, it's like this, but, you know, here it's this way. And so just understanding that we're not a monolith. Yes. <laughs> and, like, it's, it's they're, you know, maybe close, but it's, it's not exactly the same. Um, you know, and then for readers, like I said, reading outside of that experience, I want you, when you are referring to the community, to be educated and to know that not every person you encounter is going to be Mexican. Not every person that you in encounter is going to want to identify as Latinx or Hispanic. You know, they might want to claim I'm Dominican American. I'm, you know, Honduran American. I'm this American. So you should, you know, engage with that and not just categorize people. Um, so, yeah. Right. Thank you. Rio, your audience? Yeah. Oh. Well, for my poetry collection, it's different. I feel, feel like my audience is like strange black girls who grew up in places <laughs> where it's a lot of us. they were like <laughs> listening to punk rock and felt like they weren't finding themselves anywhere. And that, uh, so that's for them, just a strange, weird interior young black woman. And I feel like my children's books are also there for black children, but anyone can read them. Um, but I want black children to feel like they're being told the truth about history mm -hmm. and that there is so much that you cannot fit it into a book. There's just pages and pages. You keep going and going. Um, and if you're not reading from that experience, I want you kind of to know the same thing about black people, I, exactly that. Just writing, I think, against a single story, writing against a monolith of any kind. Thank well, you. Black history is also American history, so they should be yeah. they should be reading that. <laughs> That's right. I think that because of my experience, I wasn't writing for an audience. I didn't think I would get one. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you know, for me, it was really important just to celebrate my community. Like I grew up among these really strong, sexy, powerful women that were very fraught, and. I wanted to represent them on the page. So that was like the first thing. And then the second thing is that I also wanted to represent parts of like my lived experience. So for example, like corporate America has a really big, big, big theme in my book. And I think the way that we have to cut ourselves in this country in order to be successful, the way we have to compromise in order to be successful, the way that this, the, the empire requires that work be the first priority. And I really wanted to take that to task. And so for me, when I think about the book and what I want the book to do in the world, like I really wanted to um, start conversations around silences and around violence and around, you know, and all kinds of different violences that I think we have to survive. Um, so I'm glad now that, you know, I get to think about audience because maybe I'll have people who buy the book but you know to me I, I think it was this journey for me was really more about what does the book celebrate and not so much thinking about the reader thank you and now you're one of those fly women oh. um for me when we make it I think about you know and I say this in the dear reader when we make it is really for anybody who was told that they wouldn't make it um, but I also think about um, Diasporicans. Um, I want, um, I was thinking about uh, young people who often get shitted on for not reading. Um, I love those young people and I don't care if they've ever read a book in their life um, because they, 
you know, I think oftentimes um, young people who are going through it, um, they have these stories and um, they are discounted, you know, and it's like, well, you know, if you read a book, you know, and it's like, well, tell me about your life. Tell me about your experiences. Yo, you know, this person wrote a book about that, right? I think that me as a young person, I would have been more, um, um, I mean, I was a reader as a kid, but there was a period of time where I didn't read because I was focused on, on living. Um, but I think about those young people when I think about when we make it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, when we make it is for delinquents, <laughs> who the world calls delinquents. Thank you. We're gonna open the floor up for questions now, right? Sorry. Hi, hello everyone. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for questions, but the authors will be signing in front and there you'll be able to get your book signed and ask some questions. I'm sorry about that. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, the authors will be in front signing their books. Thank them. This was a brilliant, beautiful, talented group. <laughs>